Hey, everybody. Welcome to the We Fix Pain podcast. This is episode number eight with my friend, my mentor, my colleague, Dr. Brett Winchester of Winchester Spine and Sport. Uh, Doc, it's great to have you on the podcast. We've been trying to get you on here for a couple months. I am glad our schedule's aligned. Dino, yeah, you were always one of my superstar uh, students and uh, one of the best clinicians, so it's an honor to be on your podcast. Thanks, Doc. Um, I quite possibly have prepared the longest and probably most fun introduction that I've ever given on the podcast and probably will mm. my entire life. So uh, buckle up your seatbelt, keep your trays in the upright position. Here we go. Dr. Uh-huh. Winchester, Winchester has lectured throughout the world, teaching functional approaches to patient care, including integrated utilization of manual therapy, joint manipulation, neuromuscular stabilization, therapeutic exercise. Dr. Winchester is a fierce patient advocate that believes in empowering his patients through the realm of pain into performance. He is the founder of a multidisciplinary clinic called Winchester Spine and Sport that has a global influence and local focus located in beautiful scenic Troy, Missouri. Some highlights, he's been a chiropractor for the St. Louis Cardinals. He's taught for Motion Palpation Institute, DNS, Dynamic Neuromuscular Stabilization, He's taught advanced biomechanics at Logan College and in the chiropractic rehab diplomat program. He's lectured in England, Czech Republic, Norway, Sweden, Chile, and in Canada. He's co-authored several papers and co-authored two chapters, count them two, in Clegg Liebenson's Rehabilitation of the Spine, a Patient-Centered Approach. He's an expert in the field of rotational athletes, including golf, including tennis and including the overhead baseball athletes. He's a passionate Missouri Tigers fan. He's the proud husband and father of two kids and to Sherry as well. And he goes by several nicknames, including the Titan of Teaching, the Slayer Mm. of Subluxation, the Sultan of Stabilization, the Ringmaster of Rehab, the Genius of Gestalt, the Patriarch of Cairo Podcasting, the Dynamo of Bad Jokes, the Monet of McKenzie, the pimp of explained pain, the master of manipulation, the maestro of manual therapy, the king of colloquialisms, the only man to ever adjust Chuck Norris and live to tell about it. Doc, there's your introduction. <laughs> that was that was perfect. I loved it's a, it. It's a mouthful. Yeah, good. Well done. I don't think I ever could do that again. Good brainstorming on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A plus for creativity. <laughs> so, uh, Doc, a couple of reasons why we brought you on the podcast. The first is to talk about the uh, the functional triage. That's something that you guys have coined that I'm actually trying to refine, get better at evaluation and assessment. Uh, some more get to know you stuff. Another fun segment that we do is five random questions off the top of my head. Uh, so you can't prepare for these. So. That being said, for the folks that don't know you, um, I want to get some fun facts out there about you. So question number one, who's on your chiropractic and conservative Mount Rushmore, conservative care Mount Rushmore? You have to have Lynn Fay there, definitely, I think, for just the dynamic model from uh, an adjusting standpoint. Uh, For rehab, especially for contemporary rehab, I think you got you got to have pop up collage on that on that wall. I also like uh, the principles of Robin McKenzie. I can't say I'm 100% bought into everything with the MDT and the McKenzie Institute, but uh, he would definitely be up there. Um, there's uh, Carol Levitt, for sure, Dr. Levitt. I think you got, you'd got you have to have a space for Vladimir Yanda, I think. Um, there's definitely like some other ones that would probably deserve the space up there, but they're still living and things like that. So I don't think we quite uh, carved them in stone yet, but uh, that would be, th- those are four or five names that I that I really look up to. And, you know, you kind of mentioned, the, you know, the integration piece. And I think like people that are my age, your age, and the generations below, it's kind of up to us to kind of continue to make those systems better. And I think also like open up the world to these systems. And I feel like a lot of times, I mean, like the, the current student who's getting ready to graduate, like they may or may not know the principles of McKinsey. They may or may not know the principles of DNS. Um, oh, one I might add on there would be Michael Shacklock, even though he's still living. Um, Cause I feel like neurodynamics, we don't, we don't even use it every day per se, but when you, when you need it, you need it. So um, yeah. So I, I think it's just about like continuing to 
not bastardize everybody's stuff to to really do a good job of giving credence to you know the the originals and uh and then talking about how we can integrate it all into into one model that's a pretty robust list and if you just learn principles from those five people i think you're gonna have a successful uh practice and career fulfilling and your patients will thank you for it too so that's a pretty darn good list doc all right how now about the, the sporting part, event oh go ahead Oh, no, no. I well, was going to move it to a different direction. Go for it. Yep. No, I was just going to say, I think the hard part to the triage piece, and I always liken it to like an emergency room in a hospital. So now maybe what you and I are doing are not like such a life-threatening situation, but you and I have a decision when we walk into the treatment room to understand how to utilize those principles. And really, in my opinion, whoever does it, the best job of doing that does the best job of changing pain, but also maybe more importantly, being able to alter function and change function for the better. I, I completely concur with that. Uh, getting a pulse and kind of see, pulse is not just the physical pulse, but it's more so getting a pulse of what the case holds and where we need to, to kind of prod to figure out information, gently prod, see what the body responds as. I, I agree. Doc, what sporting event would you most like to attend? Probably the World Cup because I'm a soccer was always my main sport personally, and I I love soccer. So uh, I think either attending a Premier Soccer League game or or a World Cup event would probably be my favorite. Good news, World Cups come to the United States here in a couple of years. I'll see you in Dallas or Houston then. <laughs> exactly, I'm already already thinking about it. Maybe we'll go together. All right. Uh, most memorable teaching moment. You've had quite a few. You're a prolific educator. That's an understatement if there ever was one. What's your most memorable teaching moment? I think um, I remember being in Amsterdam uh, a while back where I had... Uh, Wait, you remembered Amsterdam? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Survived the red light district, no. Um, we, there was, uh, Stu McGill was there, uh Collage was there, uh, Vlemming was supposed to be there, ended up having to cancel last minute, but uh, I had to lecture and do a bunch of demos uh, throughout the weekend. So having two of my mentors, you know, there, that was, uh, I, that's probably the my most memorable teaching moment so far, probably. Yeah, it's an outstanding lineup and you complimented those folks pretty pretty darn well. Uh, those are some great minds up on there and yeah, I can't imagine the, the backstage conversations and you know, uh, sharing a beer at the bar and, and all of that. So that, that's pretty, pretty awesome, Doc. All right, the superpower you'd most want to have? Probably being able to look into the future, uh, I would say, uh, just because, uh, you know, in our cases, and I know you're in the, you're fresh out of the trenches yourself. And, uh, you know, some of these cases, especially as you move along, you see so much complex things that, um, you know, being able to look ahead in time and kind of know more about these cases, I think, and how they're going to turn out and, and how that might affect uh, your current treatment would probably be the superpower that I would, I would love to have. Yeah, I think we all, especially, you know, I get from you over the years that, you know, you've evolved and as you've evolved, you've learned things and you wish you could have implemented those things years ago, but you can't. But you can honestly look to patients and say, I gave it my best today. That's all you can do. That's exactly, yeah. that's well said. Better said than I said it. And then my, my thing always is my successes, I, I don't care about. My failures are really what keeps driving me to get better and better and better. So, and there's, there's oh, a lot. Oh, I know. So. You could, you could yeah. have 30 wins in a day, but you'll think about that one, that one you didn't help that <laughs> will keep you up at night. That's true. All right, last, last of the five random questions, then back on point to the topic. Your best dad joke. I know you got one. I'm looking for material. Mm, yeah, I got one. Um, what does a vacuum and a Harley Davidson have in common? I do not know. They both have a dirt bag on them. <laughs> Nicely that, done. That's probably Nicely the one done. that I get that I say the most throughout a day. So. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that in your next lecture. You all right? So, yeah. Let's let's um, add it Doc, in. So what is this? Yeah. What is this functional triage? What is this approach that you've kind of, you know, coined? Um, what is this approach? How do you guys utilize it? 
Well, I think, you know, the one thing with uh, all the years in education that, that I noticed was that the students definitely, although knowing how to do a bunch of different things, really didn't have any direction on, on how to do it. So I knew clearly, too, that, you know, some of the things we've already mentioned, the principles of DNS, McKinsey, Neurodynamics, the Motion Palpation Institute, I kind of knew that was going to be the, the pillars always. Now, we're not limited to those. We're also adding in a lot of different other things. But those were kind of the four principles that not only have, like, treatment to it, but also help us assess the patient better. So in the other thing, I guess one of the, the biggest mistakes I see maybe in the younger clinician would be the inability to be able to prioritize information. So when we walk into a case or we're assessing a case, no one's perfect, of course. There's literally 500 different things that we see that aren't ideal. So being able to be a physician and kind of understand like this would be my starting place and then being able to work your way through that case. And then when things don't go the way that we want, um, you know, how do we, you know, call an audible to make a good decision to get the case back on track? And uh, I think that when I, when I think about triage and what we're trying to create, that's that's probably the main the main thing. What you're talking about is is what I'm getting a systemized approach. There's four big, uh, I hate the word techniques, but four big methodologies you use to blend in an integrated assessment to figure out where the case is, where we want to go, and how do we navigate this the spectrum. That's kind of what I got from you there. Is that is that fair? Exactly. And and also what I like about those four is they're accomplishing different things. And those two can even be, you know, blended or married together really well. Like, for example, I feel like the principles of uh, MDT go really, really well with joint play and MPI. Uh, McKinsey manipulation, those are very end range techniques. DNS is obviously very mid range and we use the term joint centration. So um, totally a, a different thought process there. So again, like knowing when to use what technique at what time, even in the same case, you know. So, you know, today you might be a manipulation MDT case, but in two weeks you're now in the DNS hospital. So now we're, you know, we have three to four weeks to work in that. And then maybe we're working them into a more, you know, functional training and things like that. But everything is kind of on a continuum. And uh, we really work hard here to try to like understand like it, what portal of entry we're getting these cases and be sure that we we see them through and to be sure that you know I always say it's it's your reputation that's on the line so we also want to be careful that we're not under treating our patients also. Yeah, and I I, I agree. Sometimes the under treatment's worse than the over treatment as well, especially if you have not accomplished the patient's goals, what they've set out for them for themselves. So, what do you need to know? to initiate a trial of care, a treatment protocol? Um, is there specific things you look for that a patient says or specific things through the lenses of some of your evaluation tools? What do you need to know to, to begin that, 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 that treatment program? I think one of the most understated principles or ideas in all of manual medicine is the concept of centralization, you know, so from McKinsey. So, that right there, if you know, if we can take any joint on the body and we can get either abolishment of pain or we can get centralization of the of their symptoms, we already know that they're probably a patient of ours. So, you know, there's literally you know 70 papers now telling us that you know if we can find a directional preference in in the joints, which we can up to usually 70 percent of the time, then that is a patient that you and I can treat because we're going to have a rapid result. Um, you know. I firmly believe, and maybe this is just the old school chiropractor in me, but I, I firmly believe that no one's better off for walking around with big joint blockages in their body. So anyone that's got, you know, primary joint blockage in their body, I think they also are a patient of ours. Um, you could also argue for tension, tone, trigger points in the soft tissues. Um, if we're running up against those, then um, I think you and I are best suited to, to do something about that. So, and then I think too, the great physicians, they're able to realize like when we have, you know, uh, organic pathology or we have something that just doesn't feel right, being able to understand that and understand it early on. And basically clinical intuition is clinical uh, recognition. So you've paid attention to your cases for 20 years. And then when you see something a little bit differently, then, you know, you may not know exactly what the diagnosis is, but you know that we either need to get imaging, we need to get blood work, we might need a medical referral. 
uh, something is just a little bit different. And usually, you know, when a seasoned clinician has that feeling, they're usually they're usually right. Something is uh, something's off. But if you're not paying attention throughout the day and noticing the senior cases, then um, you know it's going to be very hard to do that. Yeah, and I I, I, I I'll uh, give you one example, like like you said, like um, uh, you know, one of the guys, you know, you know him pr- pretty well in Austin, Scott, a Herbawi MBT sure. guy. I mean, taught across the world. I'm 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 like a novice compared to his expertise, and he sent me a non mechanical case and he asked me to work it up, and I kept going back to neural tension, neural tension, because I'm not going to out outrange load Scott, right? Like, what value do I have? And is it my dad jokes and my bad jokes. I think I'm funnier than Scott, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> you know, and and I kept going back to neural tension. Then I started digging and pecking through the history and family history of multiple sclerosis. Ooh, that will create neural tension downstream. So it became a neurology referral on that case. And that's an understanding, like you said, to your point, understanding the red flag. Something doesn't feel weird. Scott had this spider sense. Don't know what it is. Let's send it, send it for a second opinion. Coming up with neural tension, I mean, we, we, you know, cervical flexed her, put her in a slump position. I put her in upper extremity tension tests, and it came back like this just feels tight. It feels awkward. I don't feel like I can move. You try to, you know, let me see if I can floss this away. It doesn't, it doesn't get that way. And like you said, understanding your red flags, using your lenses of evaluation kind of helped me to say you need to go to neurology within two visits, right? Like this is not critical, but you may have something in the making that's a sclerotic process that it's not not in the realm of uh, conservative care anymore well you're i mean you're a smart man i mean you know that no, you're no, probably no. I'm like not a smart said, man i just listen to people like you no well but like you knew that you're probably not going to sniff a derangement out of there that scott no. didn't find so like no, and I, this happens all. a lot to you know we get referrals from other uh chiropractors around here and i think um a common mistake is like, you know, usually what's been done. You know, if, if I get a tough case from someone who I know is like fantastic at active release, let's say, I'm not gonna just go in there with soft tissue. I'm gonna like, I understand that's probably already been done. So we're gonna have to start thinking differently, you know? And I think that's when you get a referral from, especially from other chiropractors, like you'd be, it'd be ridiculous to do the same thing over again. Although you see that happen a lot, you know? Yeah, that's insanity, right? Doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And then having the hubris to think that you're better at doing something <laughs> that's already somebody's already very skilled at it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, how have you, um, you've evolved over time. Um, and I'm not just talking about gray hair and dad bod and father figures and, <laughs> and all of that stuff. Uh, I remember, you know, when I, when, when I was your, your, your humble student, um, you were very in, integrated, involved in active release, and you were starting to talk and understand and, and kind of give us a little, little, little droppings of DNS. And you were, you were a master at manipulation and joint play. But how have you, how have you stayed away from the dogma? Because people are very married to one technique, one procedure. Um, they haven't had this, like, you call it the functional triage, but it's really a blended approach. So how have you kind of sifted and navigated away from the dogma into, I'm open-minded, I'll use this, I'll use this, I'll find the right patient for that. How have you kind of stayed above the fray? Uh, to that, I'd probably just say exposure. So, you know, for 20 years, you know, I've always allowed chiropractors, interns, you know, we've had an open door policy. You know, when I was younger, I would literally have three or four of you guys in me with every treatment room. And what that basically did is it forced me, exposed me to make sure that I was doing what I was saying I was doing. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, like, you know, and on the seminar circuit, there's a lot of charlatans where they're up there, you know, saying whatever that what they might be saying but i in the back of my mind i know they're not actually seeing patients just because i can tell by what they're saying so i think like always just be willing to it's kind of like a gun duel basically it's like well let's see some patients together or give me some difficult cases or let me you know work on a patient in front of you and never being afraid of any situation like that and i think that is probably what shaped me the most and i think small town practice also where I was kind of forced to, uh, you know, be around all the people that I haven't helped also. Uh, so that was able to kind of shape me and like, you know, eat a lot of humble pie over the last 20 years. And, uh, and then just, I'm just competitive as a human being, you know, like just always trying to 
not necessarily be better than people around me, just be better, better version of myself. And, uh, and I think as chiropractors, you know, you just kind of walk around with a chip on your shoulder because we're just low on the uh, totem pole as far as the medical world goes. So I kind of, I guess, maybe spend my life trying to, uh, you know, change the world's view of what the, the chiropractor does. So. And you've done that times about 100 because you've influenced chiropractors, you've influenced other chiropractors, you've influenced our chiropractors. So I, I'm, I'm a product of that. And to you, you know, thank you. You know, for, for doing that. Um, and I think I heard it best when you said at some point in time, you try to gamify, you try to make the patient a counter. And it's not a game, but trying to, how can I get this patient better quicker? Or how can I explain this a little bit better today, which I think keeps it fresh and, 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 and challenges you, you know, in a, in a positive way. Pressure makes diamonds, right? Uh, I can crack. Yeah. And also hemorrhoids too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I always, uh, I think like what I've really spent the last five years kind of talking a lot about is how to be better with our words. And uh, I, I was heavily influenced early on uh, by Annie O'Connor, still am influenced by Annie O'Connor. And best, I learned by yeah, following her added. quite a bit. Yeah. And I mean, I used to go up to Rehab and City Chicago and follow her when she was there. And I, not that she's not great clinically, because she obviously is, but I learned real quick that, you know, she just has a certain majestic way with patients. And, uh, and everyone's got their own shtick, but I learned that, you know, there's more to this whole thing than just triaging the functional triage. There's also empathy, there's motivation to the patient, there is certainty and confidence that they need to be able to pick up on, and all this has to happen without appearing uh, cocky or conceited. All right, treatment matching. we got a patient on the table, adjustments, manipulations, who needs it? Uh, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization principles who needs it end range loading who needs it neurodynamics who needs it let's try to get the right patient on the table so who needs the joint manipulation who needs the joint adjustment i think at, manipulation is always on the table as long as we know what we're doing with manipulation you know i uh, I understand in McKinsey how we have a progression of forces, but then you can imagine they're teaching a bunch of people that don't understand manipulation or joint play. So in the hands of an expert, I think we can manipulate very, very early on. And in fact, I think we should really. Uh, there is so much research. We were talking about directional preference early with you know six or seven papers, but if we look at manipulation now, there is there is probably five thousand papers that are telling us that manipulation is beneficial to to our people. But I think the biggest mistake is you've got to understand the principles of dynamic palpation and joint play because if you don't understand that, then you have this amazing tool, but you don't know where to use it. And when we start imparting gross force into joints that are already moving well or too much, that's when really bad things happen. So. We need to be sure that we know when to use that tool. So I think for manipulation, it's always on the table, just depending on you know how good you are at it and uh, in the case. And then DNS, I mean, as we, we see for many different reasons, people don't respire well, people don't train their bodies in the right way, people uh, have old injuries. So we're, we, you know, we change our ability to stabilize the joints throughout our body. So you and I are running up against that, you know, many times in an hour in our practice. So anyone that's falling in that category would be a DNS case. Uh, as far as neurodynamics, you, I mean, you were, you've already spoke of it before in your example. So, you know, if, if we have, if we did, if we deem they have neural tension, and I think it is important that we're able to kind of sort through whether it's a true soft tissue problem or a neurotension problem. And, uh, and then once we know that, then, you know, basically we have all the tools to be able to assess and treat our patients. We, you know, we need imaging, but especially early on, we can use these assessment tools to guide everything that you're talking about. But in saying all that, we could literally probably use every single one of those tools in the same visit if we needed to, just determine on what you and I, you know, find, but we've got to watch that we don't over treat. So, um, you know, we see a patient around here every 15 minutes. So that probably gives you some some guidelines, but uh, yeah. And I mean, I think I, I learned from uh, Clayton Skaggs early on, one of my other big mentors, uh, you know, over-treatment can also be a huge problem. So I, I really try to not over-treat the patient. It's kind of like a haircut. We can always, 
you know, we can always add more force. We can always, you know, do more reps. But, you know, I think start small and get a, get an early win and then kind of build from there. Because if you blow a case up early on, especially early on in your career before you have your reputation, they may or may not come back to you. Um, two other pieces of the puzzle. So we talked about the neurodynamics, the end range loading, the stabilization, the manipulation, the plethora of soft tissue techniques, and then the dry needling. Who's the patient that needs the soft tissue techniques? Who's the patient that needs the dry needling? How do we treatment match for those two categories that will benefit think both like, of those two services? Yeah, great question. So when you have when you've had tension and tone in a muscle just for really long periods of time, we actually get like trophicity or uh, histological change in muscle. So I think then is when I find myself, I just, and I, you're kind of close to my age too. We just didn't use instruments. I, I have no, nothing against instruments. It's just for me, you know, my soft tissue technique was active release. So uh, you went you know, to the source I, you, a while ago with Dr. Leahy too. I love that podcast, by the way. Oh gosh, I mean, so much he, gems, so many gems. There. Oh, he he was he was so good in that podcast. I thought, but uh, so I mean, that's when I'm using that. I mean, even in DNS though, I mean, we're going to run up against a trigger point that like DNS in itself is not enough, just because it's it's such a significant trigger point and it's just been there for too long. So uh, for, for those cases, I really like dry needling. I like dry needling also for when I need an acute response in an area. So that could be in a difficult lateral epicondylitis case, plantar fasciitis case, patellar tendon. But I think like sometimes people don't understand, like when we're using dry needling for that, we're trying to create an inflammatory response. So understanding that like for the next 24 to 48 hours, we need to basically kind of shut them down. We need to... Uh, not have them pitch tonight, for example, like we're purposely creating an inflammatory response in that tissue. And my experience has been that sometimes people in the soft tissue world, they don't maybe respect those rules as, as good as they could. Yeah. Try ne dry needling a uh, marathoner two days or a day before they're going to run 26.2 <laughs> miles and watch, watch them, you know, make your life miserable when they come see you on Tuesday or Wednesday after <laughs> no. the race. Uh, yeah. Guilty. I can't, can't I made imagine. That mistake, yeah. 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 Oh, so uh, trust I'm like, me. Do you want do you want your you want your race feedback? I'll 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 re I'll reimburse you that. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I mean, especially like in the professional sports. I mean, like by the time the Cairo gets to wherever their whatever team or college they're working with, they've probably been adjusted. They've been massaged. They've been you know ART'd, and then uh, all your tools are basically gone at that point. So you know, and then you're left to uh maybe you dry needle but like so sometimes you have to do something that you know may not be right for the case you know you get bullied at especially when you're when you're young in your career and then you uh then you get your your teeth kicked in a couple times and you kind of learn as you move along uh doc where 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 uh, i i have a approach um congruent with yours slightly different take on this where when I have a, a patient comes in, first thing I want to know, red flags. Second, yellow flags. Third thing, orthopedic exam. And the part that, that really tripped me up early in the process, uh, outside of I didn't understand the importance of yellow flags, was where does movement screening, watching a patient move, fit into your triage standpoint? Um, at first, I threw out all the orthopedic tests. They have no value, you know, the diagnostic um, you know, sensitivity, specificity, what are they testing? And then eventually in my career, I've come back to them to use as audits more than anything. And, but in doing that, I moved movement testing way earlier into the assessment process than it needed to be. So where does the, the, the concept of movement screening, movement assessment fit into your triage point? I think, you know, the thing that you're going to see really kind of uh, continue to be highlighted in our field is going to be clinical prediction rules for uh, joints as far as orthopedic testing where, you know, like you and I learned orthopedic tests from like uh, Evans or, you know, where, you know, we are kind of led to believe if we do this one test, it's going to tell us what the diagnosis is. You and I both know that uh, not to be true. So, you know, the movement diagnosis, and I, I, I really do believe, I think uh, in range loading a joint repetitively gives you a ton of information. It doesn't tell you everything, but it, uh, it does tell you whether or not we're going to get an early directional preference. It's also going to maybe pull out a non-responder for you. Um, I think, you know, as far as like orthopedics go, I agree with you. I, I think like this new contemporary chiropractor wants to just basically 
you know, not talk about biomechanics or not talk about orthopedics. And I think that's a mistake. I think that, uh, you know, orthopedic testing can also be used as an audit. We can come back to those tests. And a lot of times, you know, if they're going to respond with what you and I are doing, they are very good for education to the patient to show that, you know, this test was positive. Now it's no longer positive. And that's usually a really good sign for prognosis to know that you actually a trial of care is going to be beneficial for them. So as far as like movement testing per se, uh, I really, really like um, Gray Cook's approach for that. Like we don't, I'm not going to say that I'm beyond that by any means. I'm not saying that. But, you know, I think early on when you're needing, you just don't have any experience. So you need some guideposts to kind of like help you know. So I think the SFMA and FMS, they take the young you know, clinician who just doesn't have experience and teaches them to look outside of the area of complaint. Uh, and I think, you know, to uh, his credit, he's got more people looking globally than anyone else in the world. So I think like if any of the listeners don't know where to start, I think that's a great starting point. And then like Jeffrey Maitland says, at some point, you probably earn the right to take a shortcut and uh, you no longer need you. I mean, you and I, you know, we're going through our day and just taking a million shortcuts just because you can still get a good result just because of all your experience without doing a bunch of, you know, 20 redundant tests that you know what the answer is going to be, you know? Yeah. I think we refine it with time and with, with failure, right? Like, well, that didn't work. And then a little bit of a success is here and there sprinkled in, but Man, I completely, when I first got out of school, got the movement assessment. I was throwing away all the baby with the bath water. And then all these years <laughs> yeah. later, I don't believe the orthopedic tests are actually testing specific structures as much as they're great audits and patient information. So, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that movement assessment has a seat at the table. It's not the end all be all, but for the young clinician, especially those structured programs, they give you guardrails. Um, you know, like, don't get out of this guardrail and a pathway, like check this pathway, which is great. And to your point, uh, Greg Cook, is he's done it about as good as anyone. I think, too, I mean, once you watch somebody move and if we see, let's just say that we see a, a range of motion disturbance, then we also probably know maybe the joint's blocked, but we probably know the joint either is not being stabilized well or wasn't being stabilized well originally. And now we've ended up with joint blockage. So I, I think watching your patients move is still very, very valuable to do because it, it's telling you a lot. The hard part is, you know, you're going to find this all day long with your patients. So again, like being able to know where your starting point is, your portal of entry, that's what, you know, everyone kind of struggles with. So, Doc, you may rant on this one, but dogma, everything is an adhesion, everything is pain science, everything is a pinched nerve, you throw in the explanation. Uh, how have you been able to discard dogma over the years and, and really truly get to, you know, I'm, I'm assessing this patient, triaging this patient with the patient's best mind, I'm not throwing a label at that patient day one, even though that's what you may do, you may do a pin and strip, you may end up doing a neuromobe, you may end up doing a manipulation, how have you been able to discard dogma and, and just move into what, what's needed? I think for me, uh, you know, Lynn Faye used to always tell me, keep an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. And uh, so it was, you know, really always going into something with a, a clear conscience. Like, I feel like for me, at least when I originally did that with MDT, I had a lot of people around me telling me that MDT is, you know, sucks. It's there's no place for it, and I knew there that was wasn't Tom Lotus. There. I, I guarantee you that wasn't Tom. <laughs> it Lotus. was not Tom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a purist, as we say. But I he's think he's got an uh, original signed copy in a in a vault, allegedly. Yeah, oh, I, I believe that. I I, <laughs> I honestly do believe that, and that's what's kind of fun. Everybody like. You know, like for me, it's definitely MPI, DNS, neurodynamics. For Tom, it was like all in on McKinsey, you know. So it's kind of been fun to watch my friends kind of go to where they're where they're called to. Uh, but, yeah, I think that is uh, keeping, keeping an open mind. And then, like you were saying earlier, you know, you and I, we go in and we try it. And if, you know, like if it, if it doesn't work, then we're done. I mean, the, the treatment rooms are a lab. So that is what you, how you're able to kind of sort out what, what's working and what's not working for you. And, uh, 
And and then I think, you know, really I've I've I would say for myself one gold medal I do have is I'm uh, early on, especially, I mean, I really valued the apprenticeship. Uh, I think that's missing from the younger generation. They feel like they know everything and they feel like they take a seminar and, oh, I know how to do that. Um, I never had that mindset. I mean, if we're talking about MPI in school, I, I could show you 50 notes from MPI seminars. I could show you, like, I just never have the mindset of, oh, I know that now. Like, it's if, to me, it's like looking out in the ocean. It's just a constant journey of uh, refining and trying to get better and uh, understanding, putting myself in other people's shoes and what they were thinking. I do that a lot with Lynn, honestly, you know, like, you know, what he was thinking, you know, 40 years ago when he was, you know, developing MPI and, um, and really trying to like learn from what he did and then like kind of mix in some other things and uh, make an attempt to try to, you know, just enhance these, uh, uh, these, these grades. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's it's interesting. Um, like you said, I think a lot of young students will take a seminar, and you know, I learned it, mastered it. And the reality is, man, if you have somebody that's in the room that um, you know has a level that you don't, let them do the talking and just gobble it up. Because sometimes the invaluable information is just—it's not what they say; it's how they do it, right? There's yeah, and I think the younger confidence. clinician is so quick to like throw stones at like a Robin McKenzie or a Lynn Fay or a Lev, and it's like unless you've seen patients for five years, it's cute that you have an opinion, but I mean, I would say that you know just take see a bunch of patients and you might you might change your opinion, you know, and yeah. I think that's uh, I you know. I, I think that's a big problem out there these too. days. You know, like maybe maybe in your years, but maybe things something has changed. You know, and if you're not actively seeing patients, you can't you can't comment because this is a different. Like I've seen over the past two years, yellow flag after yellow flag assessment form where the pain mechanism has changed because of the events of the past stresses of the past two years and. You, you're going to tell me that I'm going to ART this or I'm not confident with that or my fascial distortion is not on point or, you know, my management skills suck. And I'm going to tell you it's all the other things getting in the way to which I can only make the patient slightly aware that that is probably the primary driver. So, yep. Uh, and I think the other thing that's been really interesting and you've seen this is the true death of expertise. It's really great to have the Internet, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook but you can put your name out there and sell yourself as an expert and really damage the, the livelihoods and, and, and the ability of somebody else to make a living because you're selling expertise where there is none. Oh, exactly. I mean, you see that now with like this, uh, you know, people who are, you know, seeing patients virtually, which I, I definitely have no problem with people doing that at all. Um, however, you know, you, you have that group that's telling us, well, you no longer need manual therapy and, uh, you know, off, off record or off camera, Mike Leahy said, we were having this, basically this exact conversation about the younger generation. And he said, uh, he goes, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say to it, except for the fact that I have 30 professional athletes that I'm going to treat today that are basically clamoring for my treatment right now. So there's something that I'm doing that's working. So I, I think that's really, really well said. And especially like people will throw stones at active release right now and they'll say, uh, you know, the mechanism's wrong, the mechanism's off. That's, you know, we don't really know why it's working, therefore we shouldn't be doing it. And I would just say, you know, as, as time goes along, we're gonna find out what the mechanism is. But to say that active release doesn't work or help people, that is insane, you yeah. know, because you and I have both seen the benefits of that. So, uh, especially in the athletic world. And um, so I think, I think we just gotta be very, very careful that in this evidence-based space, that we don't get too evidence-based to where we don't think we can do anything to help people, you know, and, uh, and that's the, I think we, that's a problem right now that we have seen that pendulum swing so far that way that uh, it's really crippling for a lot of young clinicians because they literally don't know what to do anymore because there's certain people on weekends telling them that everything they do has no research. Therefore people just need a pat on their butt. They just need to move their bodies. Well, that's not true, you know. So there's some people that need that. You and I know who those patients are, and there's other people that that require treatment. Yeah, and then some people just just you know require uh, a good swift kick in the in the in the butt, uh, and those are not necessarily the patients, but it's the people that there's no research. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. 
when clinically, you know, that patient's walking off with less utilization of healthcare services, no MRI, save thousands of dollars, and, you know, they're, they're not a, a mental case anymore. And if that's the, the best, you know, th that I can do is make them not a mental case, then that's a win for the patient in the system. Yeah, and I mean, there's um, there. who says you can't do both? You know, like, who yeah, says you yeah. can't treat a chronic pain patient? Uh, you know, we're working functional medicine with them. They're also working out in the gym. We're also doing treatment. So, I mean, to me, that's the future of medicine right there. So it oh, doesn't yeah. have to be so binary to where, you know, you can't combine all these things together in these cases. Yeah, and aren't we just an integrated system, right? Like your internal uh, environment, healing environment, impacts your neuromuscular skeletal healing environment, which impacts your psyche, which and you just keep going down the rabbit hole and to pigeonhole medicine into it's MSK only, it's end endocrine metabolic only, is it's a huge fallacy. Reduction yeah, that's, I guess, fallacy. that's probably my biggest learning moment in the last 20 years of Western medicine has become so specialized. And because of that, it, it is creating a huge void and a problem. And that's why, you know, our you know, the patients are literally clamoring for functional medicine because there is not somebody to direct tra this traffic in all these different systems that you're talking about. And you and I are in a perfect position moving forward to be able to do that for them. Yep, I agree. I agree. Doc, so where is this process headed for you? You guys came up with this concept of fun functional triage. You utilize it in an office. You teach it. Uh, I've seen some good stuff in the FTCA. You guys did some awesome presentations, I think, a year or two ago on that. Where is this process headed for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it is when I, I mean, we got some stuff that, uh, you know, we were, we probably aren't going to divulge cause it'll jinx it. But, uh, I think it's just, um, yeah, I will, I'll start with the podcast. I mean, like that started off as just a COVID, you know, fun project that has grown legs. Like I just can't even, I'm my own worst critic, but I, I will honestly say, I cannot believe what, what that's done. So we'll probably continue to find, you know, ways to, to make that better, uh, better integration. I think, um, better, you know, explaining, uh, the thought process behind these things. I think that's a missing link in, uh, in what you and I do. So, you know, like, and I work hard in our office to be able to walk around and at any time I should be able to ask an intern or, uh, a Cairo or, or anybody, why are you doing what you're doing and make them give me a good answer? And I think that, you know, to continue to work on, on those ideas. All right. We're going to close this down with two segments. Um, the first, it's a rapid fire five for five. This is you guys have done this to guests. I'm putting you on the clock. Oh, I'm, one, I'm nervous. One minute, five topics, one minute, whatever comes on out. Let me get this timer set. Here we go. One minute here. All right. Uh, when I stop, you're going to go. So give me your best two to three tips to prevent throwing injuries, including rotator cuff, labrum, and the UCL. Biomechanics. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> as much as I know from like the principles of DNS and things like that, which are very important, I think it was, so if we're talking in UCL Tommy John surgery, I'm going to tell you that you start with biomechanics probably. It's 80% of the problem. Okay. That was good. That was 20 seconds. Um, let's go with, uh, golfing back injuries with golfing and golf performance. Give me your best two to three tips on preventing a golf injury and maximizing your golf performance. Need and better ready? intra-abdominal go. pressure. Oh. Go better intra-abdominal pressure. We need thoracic mobility. We need mobility through the hips. And then I think with golf too, like to make a better golfer, you can have all of those things I just mentioned in place. Hitting a golf ball is a very technical skill. So sometimes we just need to, as Greg Rose says, sometimes you just need a golf pro. So uh, we need the body to perform well, but we also need instruction on how to hit the golf ball well. So we're kind of back to mechanics again for the for the golf swing. Cool. Yeah, you did good, man. You got 28 seconds to go on that one. All right, number three. I could talk three. for four hours on that one, but I got to watch it. You're, yeah. <laughs> I can that's tell you a, everything that's a loaded to wrong question. on a golf swing. <laughs> In DNS golf, we do <laughs> that. Right. We talk about it for three hours on it. There you go. Uh, so give me two or three tips to develop power explosion, especially in dynamic sports like lifting, jumping, or sprints. I think, you know, the, not to be redundant, but 
the concept of intra-abdominal pressure from DNS is the one missing link across so many different systems. So I think you start there and then the best rotational athletes, they're able to move in rotation and not move in the coronal plane. So whatever we can do to teach them how to keep themselves in rotation for torque generation and torque production without having to overutilize the sagittal or the coronal plane is the hallmark of great rotational athletes. So what you do about that, everyone's got a different opinion on, but I'll start with that. And that is, that is very critical. That's a fundamental concept. Stu McGill even says it: proximal stability, distal mobility, so you can develop power uh, and then speed with that too. And uh, you know we overlook it, but it's basic, it's fundamental. But man, a lot of practitioners just overlook that. If you had if you had a bird's eye view of any rotational activity, kicking, throwing, hitting, punching, the best in the world. If you watch their pelvis, bird's eye view, they can move in the transverse plane only. The rest of us, we can do that, but we also require movement in the coronal plane. So to kind of piggyback what I just said, what, whatever we need to do from a young age to start to understand what that means in their body. Cool. All right, Doc, next question. We got two more here. Ready? All right, so your best two to three tips to stay fit, stay active, stay healthy, and stay young at 40-plus years of age. I'm 45. I rode 20 miles on my bike this morning, and I've already awesome. worked out for uh, an hour and 15 minutes. So I think uh, it's annoying when people tell how good they eat and you know how they how much they work out. But uh, I guess the secret about me is I eat probably as well as anyone I know, and I work out all the time, even though I don't love working out, but I know it's good for me. So um, yeah, I would say. That's the secret to my success and prioritizing that every day and finding a way to get it in. And you're going to have bad ones. Every week I have workouts that I'm not proud of, but you just show up and <laughs> do your time, I guess. Survive it. Yeah, I think that's the measuring step, working out or doing something when you don't want to do it and you're not 100% and you do it anyway. I think that's where the gain is. And the gain isn't physical that day. It's mental. Exactly. Well said. All right. Last, uh, last one here. All right. Your best two to three tips. Uh, I admire you quite a bit um, because I think you found your true passion at life, what you're great at, your true calling. You practice it, you live it, you preach it, you teach it. So this is for the folks out there that need a little bit of direction on how to find their purpose, passion, and calling in life. So give me your top two to three tips to live a life of purpose and meaning. Find your passion, find your drive, and find your why. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meeting, the key to living a productive, happy life is to wake up with a purpose. So it may not be this. For me, it is. And for you, I know it is also. So uh, if you're in this field and it's not ripping you out of bed in the morning, then you probably got the wrong uh, profession. Um, but if, you, if you've chosen the right profession, I think just having that growth mindset, as Carol Dweck says, and, you know, just waking up trying to get better every single day and then um you know I, i'm a reader avid reader so i just you know every day of my life i'm listening reading books and trying to better myself at different ideas and concepts sometimes honestly too it's like outside of the world of what you and i do it's it might be some other thing i love history um i love presidential history i love war history so I think you can really learn a lot sometimes by stepping outside of your field and seeing what greats do in other areas. All right, Doc. Thank you. I, uh, I appreciate your time. Any final closing thoughts? No, uh, I've uh, it obviously enjoyed my time with you, Dino. I, uh, you're a beacon of light. So it's been, uh, I can tell you as an educator, the most exciting thing for me is to see people like yourself my former students just go on and be leaders in our profession. So uh, that's uh, that makes my day. So seeing you and your success is uh, what keeps me going. We owe a lot to you. Credit to you and and to the people behind you, your family and everybody else and uh, behind you for you know help shaping us and molding us. Uh, you know, one of these days, this chunk of coal is going to turn into a diamond because of people like you. <laughs> Um, where can people find you? How can people find out about your business, social media, plug, plug your handles. 
well, with me being 45, I guess I'm a Facebook guy, but uh, <laughs> Facebook is, you know, getting better at Instagram. I'm, I'm sticking my toe in Twitter a little bit, but uh, it's a that would probably step. be, it, oh gosh, that world is insane. But uh, yeah, probably uh, Facebook, we have uh, with our podcast, Gestalt uh, Education. Uh, we're proud of that. That'd be a good place to kind of uh, find us there. And uh, yeah. All right, Doc. Thank you so much. I will put all his uh, information, including Winchester Spine and Sport, social media handle, handles in the notes and comment section for the podcast. Doc, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being a leader in profession, a mentor, a colleague, and a friend. I look forward to catching up with you sometime, most likely DNS2 at some point in time. Dino, you're a superstar. Thank you. All right. See you, Doc.